Cities Adaptation to Climate Change in EECCA. This webinar was organized by NOST and uh, the CAN EECCA network. Um, and OST is running a project that is uh, on online journalism. It's called Online Journalism in Depth. And one of the topics the project is dealing with is climate change. So we are really happy to cooperate with CAN EECCA in organizing this webinar. Mm -hmm. My name is Annika Hudala. I'm a project manager at an OST and uh, I'm a colleague of Irina, who unfortunately cannot talk today. So this is why I am moderating this session today. As you may know, COP28 started last week in Dubai, and today is one of the thematic days dedicated to urbanization and cities. And in line with this global event, our webinar aims to dive deeply into crucial questions and discussions surrounding urban adaptation to climate change, specifically within the Eastern Europe, Caucasus and Central Asia region. And I'm really happy to introduce to you our experts that we have today. The first is uh, Dr. Maria Salaleva. She originates from Belarus, but has been living in Ireland for a long time already. And she is a very in uh, internationally very well-known expert in the field of sustainable urban development and adaptation to climate change. She is head of the board of the international NGO ECA Project, and she has worked as a consultant to many international organizations, among them the United Nations. Welcome, Maria. The second speaker is Mariam. Mm -hmm. uh, Thank she, you. Uh, Mariam uh, is working in the Georgian NGO Green Alternative in Tbilisi, where she's responsible for the environmental and climate change program. And she has been doing climate research for quite some time uh, in Scotland. Her research interests are climate finance, locally led adaptation, climate change impacts, and intersectionality. Welcome, Mariam. Thank so you. we first will have uh, the two presentations and after that we will have a discussion. If you have questions or comments, uh, please uh, put them all in the uh, in the chat and uh, after the presentation our experts will be happy to answer your questions. A last uh, uh, hint from my side, uh, if you wish to listen to this webinar, not in English but in Russian, you can press the button. Uh, on the in the bottom part of the frame you can see and there you can choose the channel the language channel and uh, the translation and then you can listen to the webinar in Russian yeah thank you very much so far and Maria the floor is yours thank you so much Annika give me a second I will share my screen. Can, can you see my screen? Yes, I, I think that you do see it. Irina, could you please nod your head? Yeah, okay, okay, so you're nodding. <laughs> Hello, once again, esteemed participants. And it is true, as Anik Rajas mentioned, uh, uh, COP28 um, is ongoing at the moment. And in the recent years, I would say uh, in the recent decades, a lot of attention is paid to the cities in this context. And uh, if you're not that well aware of the process of international climate policy and how everything is happening uh, at the UNFCCC COP uh, conference, uh, I believe that we'll know that the Paris Agreement that was adopted in 2016 became the starting point and basically the main document that shapes uh, and frames international climate policy. And one of the novelties and one of the key things uh, in the Paris Agreement, uh, as opposed to the climate policy that we used to have before that, is that one of the very important factors of international climate policy were recognized the so-called non-state actors or non-governmental, well, not even organizations, but stakeholders. And one of such uh, uh, were the cities. 
And from the viewpoint of the climate policy, the urban development, it was a huge leap because it was recognized that um, urban area cities uh, should be the driving force. They should act as stakeholders in climate policy at the international level because A, they can do that. They have financial possibilities to do that, intellectual opportunities to do that. And cities are places that have lots of opportunities, but at the same time also have lots of risks. Therefore, with every new conference of the parties, with every new COP, we see that more and more attention is paid to the cities. That is why today we're going to precisely talk about them. I will talk about some general type things about how you can approach this topic and what you can do uh, in terms of picking the topics uh, in the context of city adaptation to climate change. And Maria will give you a case study about Georgia. Because if we're talking about climate change, it's important to talk about both adaptation and mitigation. Of course, there are some general trends for all the cities. Despite that, every city is unique. So it's very hard to cover all of that within one presentation and mention the adaptation measures that could be applicable for all cities. Okay, cities and climate change. How can we uh, prevent possible adapt to the um, unavoidable? Well, thank you so much, Aneka, for introducing me so well. I don't have anything to add, actually. So let's proceed with the presentation. We all know that we're living in the era of the climate change, and I believe that you have heard a lot about that. We're not going to dwell upon it for a long time. I would like to only remind you, our climate is changing, and it is an obvious fact. The temperature of the air over the last 100 years has increased uh, for about one degree compared to the pre-industrial level. And in the Northern Hemisphere, we believe now the temperature is increasing way more rapidly. Aside from that, if we look at the dynamic of risks, we can tell that risks related to climate change, the risk related to change of biodiversity and other types of environmental risks uh, are now becoming to come into the forefront. And if a decade ago, the main risks were related to economy, policy and politics. Now, the main risks, according to the experts, uh, and this is the data from uh, the World Economic Forum report, and they publish it annually. And according to the expert assessments and evaluation, the risk is that our climate actions will not be sufficient. And this is basically what precisely is discussed at COP at the moment, uh, is coming to the forefront more and more. And sadly, so far, our effort is not sufficient. It is not enough. Because to respond to climate change in a better way, we have to stop uh, the growth of the global temperature uh, by 1.2 degrees by the end of the century, but it has already increased by one degree. And the maximum threshold for us is two degrees. But now, with all the effort that the countries have assumed and promised to implement, we are now following the trajectory that leads us to the temperature increasing by three degrees by the end of the century. And of course, it's going to lead to huge challenges. Because uh, even if the temperature increases 1.5 degrees or two degrees, uh, there will be dramatic change. And that change, we're only at the start of this change. And according to the assessments of the researchers, even if we stop uh, greenhouse gases emissions now in some magical way, main climate change are waiting for us in the coming decades because uh, greenhouse gases have the tendency to pile up in the atmosphere and it is pretty hard to remove them from there. So we're living in the era of climate change. We have created that ourselves. We are now trying to slow down this process, but nevertheless, we should keep in mind that everything that we're doing, everything that we're planning, our entire infrastructure, social and economic structure will exist in different conditions in the coming few decades. So what do we need to do? We need to decrease impact on climate and mitigate uh, greenhouse gas emissions and adapt to the unavoidable change. But at the same time, we have to provide opportunities for the economic and social development because 
in fact as we're well aware one of the key things in the international climate policy is uh, the answer to question how do we give opportunities to the developing countries so that their towns and cities can provide for the proper life of their citizens and uh, we have to stick to the first two conditions which is decrease in impact and adapting to climate change now cities urban development probably the biggest news here is that starting early 2000s we have been living at the city dwellers planet before 2000s uh, if we take um, uh, the previous uh, eras their majority was formed by the rural population but it has changed and now we see that the role uh, of cities is growing therefore the population of the cities is also increasing the level of urbanization will be increasing in almost all regions worldwide it will also be happening in europe and eastern europe and eastern europe will already live as a pretty urban region already now nevertheless we'll see growth further growth on this bar uh, graph you can see uh, the uh, level of urbanization and percent but of course we can see that mostly we see growth in asia and africa in their urban population nevertheless uh, the share of people in eastern europe who live in the cities will also keep increasing so what is happening in the cities what is happening with the city dwellers becomes more and more important for us okay talking about city and climate we can look at it from two perspectives from two angles first and foremost the city impact and the climate cities and urban territories are a huge source of greenhouse gas emissions for a clear set of reasons because in the cities uh, we have the main energy consumption about 75 percent of energy that is consumed is consumed in the cities and it is clear that cities uh, also are the heart of most production facilities and as urban territories are increasing and urban population is also growing we understand that more energy is consumed and more greenhouse gases are emitted but at the same time the good news is that uh, cities can also form part of the solution because cities have all of their scientific and research potential that hopefully will allow us to decrease the greenhouse gas emissions uh, to cut them and according to the recent assessment the greenhouse gases emissions in the cities can be decreased uh, by 20 percent by 2050 even if we're applying the current technologies aside from that city is a pretty peculiar uh, environment uh, and the fabric of the city uh, the plan of the city uh, impacts uh, climate in the city they are creating microclimate within the city such a well-known thing as heat islands for example well, we can say that this is a bad news if we're talking about the climate change, but a good news uh, is that uh, if we approach this matter in a responsible way, we can manage climate, microclimate of our cities with the help of the same tools that we are creating with the help of construction, uh, planting and greeneries, uh, working with uh, wind flows. But again, it's not going to happen on its own. We have to work on it. On the other hand, climate impacts the city. And here we could say that climate impacts the city. That's just the same way as it impacts other territories. But when we look at how climate impacts the city, we should understand that uh, climate impact in the city because city is a very concentrated territory. There is a high concentration of people, high concentration of infrastructure facilities. So basically, the city's impact on climate is also very concentrated. Here we can talk about impact on food supplies because we know that cities uh, consume most of the supplied food. Uh, over 70% of food is consumed, but very little food is produced in the cities for clear reasons, because the majority of foods is produced in rural areas. Aside from that, in modern cities, the majority of food is produced uh, far away from the city, even sometimes far away from the country where the city is located. For the cities that are located close uh, to the shore, close to the water, another relevant issue is increasing sea levels. Uh, and it is relevant uh, 
also for some cities that are pretty far from the sea because change of conditions in one city impacts another city and if uh, the city becomes smaller because it is located closer to the sea the people will migrate to a different city also increasing temperature and um, uh, problems with precipitations uh, for example in belarus according to the forecast uh, the total amount of precipitation probably is not going to change that much in the coming years and decades but we can see that uh, how extreme uh, different periods are is changing there are more draft periods and periods with excessive precipitation which results in flooding especially in urban cities where everything is covered in asphalt where using traditional construction technologies uh, water drainage is mostly happening with the help of the engineering infrastructures uh, and sewers but when there is the excess water urban territory becomes the most prone for floods and some of such phenomena can be a disaster and this is what mariam is going to talk about using the case study of Tbilisi and such phenomena floods and droughts are becoming more and more frequent in the city of course impact on buildings and infrastructure first and foremost because any infrastructure in any city in the world uh, was built taking into account climate conditions if such conditions change clearly the usage of this infrastructure also changes and if we're talking about food of course we cannot uh, omit talking about the quality and uh, quantity of water because city consumes a lot of water both technical water and potable water that is uh, uh, consumed by the people and the quality and quantity of this water is also changing so as we have already mentioned cities have their own risks that are explained by the high density of population high density of infrastructure and high potential price of the damage done but at the same time there are opportunities uh, which is scientific and research potential uh the opportunities in management and planning and we have so already mentioned that uh, cities uh, are discussed more and more and taken into account more and more in terms of uh, planning global climate policy because it becomes obvious uh, that two cities of the more or less same size in the same conditions uh, probably have something to talk about uh, even more so than two countries because people are faced with the same problems and this is precisely why this process explains that in the recent decades uh, basically we saw the increase of some urban unions international programs uh, uh, such as the covenant of mayors european covenant of mayors global covenant of mayors uh, such unions of uh, cities as, as c40 which is a union of the larger cities and the cities are trying to solve it so how do they solve it so we can divide uh, into different areas first of all the city has to be aware of what is going to happen it means estimation of climate uh, climate risks and uh, the possibility of what could happen then uh, climate resilient planning and um, specific solutions and we know that it is impossible to plan separately how the city would be developing and how the city would be solving the climate risks these two programs and processes they have to be interrelated for example decisions that the city is taking they have to be compliant with the general climate strategy of the city in order to decrease uh, the negative uh, uh, climate impact uh, that a city is uh, uh, doing, we have to adopt specific measures, for example, low carbon economy development. And since we're working with um, these risks, um, the new risks, so we see new problems, for example, such as climate justice and uh, solving social problems that become more and more acute in the context of uh, climate change. Speaking about adaptation processes and decreasing the risks, a city could take a number of different solutions, so-called grey technologies and infrastructures, green measures like ecosystem solutions and soft solutions 
This is everything that includes uh, policy making, planning, financing, IT, including education, campaigning, everything that uh, brings together the first two types of measures. The gray measures and infrastructural solutions are the most common solutions that we see. They are classical, if you will. At the same time, they are the most costly and in this constantly changing conditions of uncertainty when we don't know how exactly we're able to mitigate the climate change and how the situation will develop for the future, the gray measures are the most reliable. Here, for example, you have uh, an example of the biggest infrastructure project on the flood protection. This is a uh, Thames um, barrier infrastructural project that has been constructed around 40 years ago. And we were just entering this epoch of climate change. And it was considered that this barrier would be used three to four times per year, while now it is being used six to seven times per year. And the forecasts are suggesting that the usage of this barrier will grow year to year. So this large infrastructural project could be financed, could be a graded and improved depending on the circumstances but if these are smaller projects let's say uh, coastline cities and settlements react uh, to the increased uh, sea level they are building small dams so this little project uh, could uh, attract a lot of financing a lot of investments and could be built but in 20 or 30 years they will not be applicable anymore so this type of uh, infrastructural solutions they are good for the short term but not for the long term uh, not uh, all cities are capable of building such huge dams like in London, but for example in St. Petersburg there are also large solutions that are being applied to protect the city against the, the floods, but in many cities uh, smaller projects are being used. For example, those of you who live uh, in European cities, probably you have noticed that quite often in the streets you can see such uh, temporary walls that protect the city from the water flows, from the flood. Lots. Another simple solutions include uh, increase of the um, of the level of the buildings, uh, like uh, bringing it higher. For example, here on the picture you see the uh, highest th like threshold um, in the entrance to the underground to the subway. So when there is heavy rain, this water flows wouldn't be getting inside. So in order to be more adaptive, we should uh, use traditional technologies because we all aware of the fact uh, when let's say people live in the urban areas and in general in the regions where there are a lot of uh, snow precipitations. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. One moment. So, in those areas, so you probably know that there is a very thick foundation for every building. In those areas where the temperatures aren't so low and there is not so much of snow uh, falling out during the, the year, the foundations are generally lower. So more cities could start implementing this uh, thicker and higher foundations for their buildings. The next group of measures is green measures, which includes ecosystems in order to protect the areas from um, different hazardous uh, uh, weather conditions. For example, such uh, ecosystems could be used in order to uh, prepare the protection against the heat waves. Let's say we know uh, if uh, there is a greenery, there are more trees uh, planted around the uh, building, it improves uh, the uh, heat protection and it decreases the usage of air conditioners. Green solutions are often being used in order to prepare the floods, hazardous situations. So these are so-called uh, draining systems that uh, 
uh, redirect the water flows from specific areas. We already mentioned uh, that uh, water floods uh, happen when the area is asphalted and uh, this uh, water is being streamed uh, uh, into the city. So the question is how to create uh, such areas within the urban um, places where we could plant more trees uh, that would be helpful but on the same side how it could be um, convenient comfortable for example wouldn't be a nest for various insects so uh, in general the measures and solutions which we find this is a mixture of gray and green measures green measures the uh, gray measures for example they help us uh, to implement some industrial solutions for example use some specific membranes uh, to filter the water um, the water which is uh, being absorbed into the soil is already pre-filtered so we shouldn't just plant more trees but we have to approach these solutions in a smart way combining both and green measures soft measures in their turn include policies um, regulations campaigning informing here as an example you can see a geo system in norway and in many other countries around the world there are very similar systems of alarming of um, notifying about uh, unfavorable weather conditions for example there you could see a system on the previous slide uh, of uh, informing uh, uh, agricultural communities so these type of systems when integrated well they help uh, to build low carbon economy i wouldn't go deeper here but it is important to say that uh, while planning this development strategy we have to understand the context well because the global economy is being reoriented at the moment to low carbon economy this is a lengthy process and uh, in order if in order to be compatible and um, um, in order to uh, uh, compete the market uh, cities uh, have to find new solutions uh, and uh, to enter this new trends this new economy one of another topical things uh, is climate justice and ensuring climate justice because uh, urban areas have high density of uh, population which inevitably leads uh, to emerging of uh, so-called vulnerable groups which includes uh, elderly people people with disabilities uh, uh, women with children etc and uh, when the environment becomes uh, uncomfortable it hits uh, in the first um, it hits first and foremost to those vulnerable groups so here for example we have uh, to avoid such uh, uh, situations you can see in the picture this is from Brazil when trying to create some beautiful islands of nice environment uh, the climate injustice uh, is being highlighted so some people receive the preference of enjoying these beautiful areas while other people have to suffer so all the subjects they have to be included into urban planning but since this uh, uh, webinar is for journalists uh, and for media representatives this is the subject that uh, journalists have to write articles about very often climate change is perceived uh, by um, reporters by journalists uh, as a general um, climate problem but all these topics are not stand al standing alone they are all interlinked with uh, social aspects with economical aspects with many others so the main a set of tools uh, includes uh, climate planning which should uh, combine mitigation and adaptation to climate change many cities are already developing such strategies and have developed miriam is saying that Tbilisi has such a strategy already in order to develop such a strategy a plan one should uh, adopt a systematic planning approach bringing together different resources and tool in order to mitigate the risks and improve the advantages 
and here all the parties have to participate in the process. So here we find such a peculiar aspect which suggests the following. In order to develop a climate uh, strategy, this uh, city has to have democratic governance. It seems at first that these things are not very much related, but they are very related. Specifically, if we want to create a business and production system which would be integrated into the green economy, it foresees cooperation of all different parties and hearing the voices of all parties of all actors, be it a business community, um, governance, uh, state and regional authorities or vulnerable communities, etc. I think this is um, it from me. These were the main points which I wanted to share. You can find more information in my book, um, The New City for the New Climate. If you have any questions, I'm here for you. And I'm giving the floor to Mariam for telling us what is happening in Georgia and in Tbilisi. Thank you, Maria, so much. It's my pleasure to be on the... Дуже большое спасибо, Мария. Мне очень приятно. Oops, sorry, I'm talking in the wrong channel. Turn off the original audio. So, hello, everyone, and thank you and Ost for inviting me. Uh, I'm going to start sharing my presentation and thanks Maria for this overarching presentation, which makes uh, my um, speech even easier <laughs> to understand and for me as well to uh, go deeply. Uh, so uh, my expertise is not uh, in the cities. I want to emphasize that uh, I work on adaptation. Currently, I'm working with UNEP on developing small scale funding for mountain communities in uh, South Caucasus uh, on adaptation. So um, I work on adaptation solutions and also um, follow the policies, national and local ones. So I will try to give you some examples based on my experience. Um, uh, so these topics, um, uh, so I will be focused on Georgia, and I'm also from Georgia. Uh, um, and um, firstly, I will start about um, uh, some broad examples of vulnerability of Georgia to climate risks. Uh, and then I will try to focus on urban areas um, and, you know, the capital of Georgia is Tbilisi. So I will bring some examples based on um, uh, policies in Tbilisi and climate risks. Uh, then Maria already mentioned about Tbilisi resilience strategy that uh, Tbilisi has. So I will I'll try with you to go through these uh, goals of uh, this strategy and what is the state of implementation. And then I also want to share some uh, findings of my research, which um, we just presented last week, um, about how women see um, these problems and needs in uh, urban areas of Georgia. And then I will summarize with the systemic planning and the um, need of systemic planning and barriers and problems for that. Um, so in general, um, like it cannot be said that there is any country which is not vulnerable to climate uh, crisis. Uh, so each country is vulnerable to it, and so is Georgia. But we know there, are, like uh, there is also ranking, and depending on different factors, we can say this country or this area of the country or society is more vulnerable due to preparedness, lack of preparedness or having these resources or not, and so on. Uh, so in general, what I can say about Georgia, so we have this uh, fourth national communication of Georgia to NFCCC, and this is the main document we usually use um, to uh, see what is the available data and what science says about uh, vulnerability and impacts of climate change. And it's already fifth national communication preparation now in process. So this document says that 70% um, of the country's territory and up to 60% of settlements are susceptible to risks of ex different extent uh, to climate change. And um, 
the, there is um, environmental uh, national environmental agency and its geology department uh, measures um, uh, some like uh, the extent of vulnerability of different areas in Georgia and it says as of 2000 um, uh, 18 uh, 18 percent of georgia's populated area were um, under risk high risk of geological hazards um so it uh, gives us indication um, of the need of adaptation or loss and damage and unfortunately loss and damage has not been discussed in georgia in any context uh, and um, we have this um, georgia's um, climate change strategy and it um, specifically says that this strategy is about mitigation, not not about adaptation. Uh, and then we have also um, national disaster risk reduction strategy of Georgia, but it was for 2017 to 2020. Um, so it has not been updated either. Uh, and what is the problem here is that we don't have national adaptation plan and the government always or the ministry always say like that they are waiting this document to be um, written and then it will show us clear um, uh, like steps and solutions what we will need to undertake. So they are always postponing the responses and waiting for this uh, uh, national adaptation plan, which has not uh, like the work has not started on it yet officially um so i uh, also wanted to mention that uh, before i will go to the um, uh, urban areas that in general it's high exposure to climate change risks in georgia and this year showed us um, this clearly we had tragic landslide in um, high mountains of Georgia, in Racha region, and um, it claimed the lives of 22 people. Uh, and um, like it showed also unpreparedness and of the state institutions to respond to disasters. So we realized that um, the emergency management service arrived at the disaster run after two hours after this landslide and after this event uh, not even after one month we had another flooding in Guria another area of Georgia uh, and three people died there and at least 300 families need to be resettled um, so it seems like in Georgia unfortunately we have ad hoc planning um, uh, of the adaptation response because we don't have a clear clear strategy or um, uh, like step-by-step -step processes going on to manage adaptation. Um, that's why I hope this year will be turning point for us to start to transformational adaptation solutions in the country. Otherwise, uh, we see clearly how all the damages we face um, due to that. Uh, so I will try to go now, like focus on urban areas. Um, uh, what are the factors uh, that define vulnerabilities of urban areas um, in Georgia? So in general, um, we see that um, due to lack of uh, basic social services in uh, rural areas, people tend to migrate in urban areas. Um, and uh, urbanization, that's why, has increased um, in last decades, which brought various uh, changes in cities and challenges too. Um, so it was around more than half population live in urban areas uh, and half of it lives in the capital. Uh, and we know that urbanization refers to expansion of urban centers, which is associated with modification in land cover, transforming natural land cover into dense concentrations of buildings, pavements, and other surfaces. So as a result, as Maria also explained, it creates urban heat island effect, and there are already researches which shows that Tbilisi experienced heat island effect. Um, so the temperature, air temperature is much higher in the center than in um, suburbs of the city. Uh, which, um, and yeah, it's relevant to Tbilisi and um, uh, it uh, poses risks to serious illnesses and 
deaths. Uh, and due to like according to various researches, it shows that uh, elderly people with chronic illnesses and poor health conditions, also people with uh, lower income groups are more exposed to, re to risks of um, heat waves. And it's a map uh, by World Bank, which shows like traffic congestion uh, in the center that it's uh, like accumulated there, which also which is also linked to the high air pollution. And I um, will go to the next slide and I'm going to also uh, talk about other factors uh, of vulnerability. So air pollution, as I mentioned. And it's a picture of um, industrial city close to Tbilisi. It's called Rustavi. Uh, so, and um, there is a movement uh, called Kavi Gudet, and it's picture taken by them. So it shows uh, the air pollution, and it's really high. So air pollution in urban areas has already deteriorated um, uh, health conditions and in Tbilisi as well, but not only in Tbilisi. And um, according to Public Defender, um, air pollution was identified as the main reason uh, for more than 6,000 uh, deaths uh, in Georgia. And um, another aspect is that um, uh, available green spaces for uh, people uh, in the cities, um, which helps uh, to people to combat uh, heat waves and also have air quality. But um, unfortunately, green areas per capita is not determined uh, for Tbilisi yet. Um, and uh, another aspect is also housing characteristics. And in some European cities, we see already they are adopting some criteria that uh, is important to um, classify buildings as a climate resilient. But in Tbilisi, we don't have it yet. And in some cities, this is coastal city called Batumi. We see already storms are intensifying and also sea level rise. And you see uh, these like main um, uh, um, settlements and also infrastructure is accumulated uh, along the coast, uh, which makes them vulnerable to climate risks. Um, uh, now I'm going to focus on uh, Tbilisi and uh, Tbilisi is also like um, facing many challenges due to climate change, which is mostly rainfall related floods, but it's uh, um, it's enhanced like these effects because of Tbilisi's geomorphology, imperfectly controlled construction, uh, malfunctioning drainage system and so on. And uh, Tbilisi encounters also other problems of landslides, uh, ground instability and uh, seismic activities. And later on, I will um, tell you other problems associated with that, which makes the city vulnerable. And we had a uh, huge um, flooding in Tbilisi in the center of the city in 2015. Um, and people died there and also many families displaced, um, infrastructure was damaged, including houses, roads, and including Tbilisi Zoo as well. So, and this is the picture like of the people mobilized next day to clean up a whole um, um, a floodplain. Um, and um, unfortunately, like, like all these uh, institutions started to work on on, um, uh, disaster risk management after this event so it took several uh, years maximum that they were working on it even it was a committee established and after that uh, this topic got lost in other topics so it's not really active in Tbilisi right now working on it and even worse like this picture is uh, current picture we have this massive um, crack uh, on the uh, ground um, uh, in, in Tbilisi uh, and we know it's moving but uh, we don't see any uh, proper response how to manage this landslide um, uh, so yeah heat waves frequency and duration um, is increasing increased risks make city infrastructure including public transport sensitive to hazards and extreme weather and we know that public transport um, uh, is mainly used by women students low-income people and unemployed people in Tbilisi which means that um, 
exposure of marginalized people to additional risks is increasing uh, due to that. So focusing on uh, policies uh, of Tbilisi, we have this resilient Tbilisi strategy um, and which says that by developing a resilience strategy, Tbilisi becomes more able to respond to adverse events and um, better able to deliver basic functions, uh, especially uh, to the more vulnerable in the city. Um, it's a statement uh, it um, tries to achieve, but and uh, it was based on different um, other um, policies, which is uh, land use master plan, local economic development plan, sustainability, sustainable urban mobility plan, which unfortunately it was the aim to have to start implementing um, already on 2000. 19, but it has not uh, been uh, finalized yet. Um, uh, they start to like the city hall published the draft last year, so it has not been um, finalized yet. Uh, we have green city action plan as well, and then uh, the resilient PLC was the final output and. I will also briefly mention what is the problems of implementing these policies in Tbilisi. So, for example, Tbilisi Green City Action Plan aims to renew the fleet of public transport buses with uh, low or zero emission buses. Now, but despite this commitment in 2018, when this action plan uh, was already in action, uh, Tbilisi City Hall purchased... Uh, um, 90 diesel powered buses. <laughs> then um, another failure is that uh, these usually spatial planning documents uh, are not mandatory uh, for the cities to follow. Um, and then responsibilities of representative bodies uh, is not uh, clear either. Uh, so usually, um, so when it's not required to implement uh, the recommendations based on this master plan, usually we see that um, uh, the, the decisions are different without any explanation rather than uh, recommended by master plan. Uh, so, for example, Tbilisi Master Plan offered that um, uh, there should not be any uh, recreational zoning changes um, uh, in 11 areas, but they changed the status anyway for one um, around one um, uh, lake area in Tbilisi and started to redevelop. Uh, this place and also there was another case uh, and people mobilized around it but it didn't work um, that about the uh, dilapidated uh, houses uh, that government started to adopt amendment and legalize all these dilapidated houses which has not which didn't met um, uh, the standards before so they changed uh, some like uh, standards uh, to um, let people start living in houses even though they were not matching to um, the safety standards properly mm, so we see like these kind of failures or problems associated with implementing these action plans even though we have it uh, and um, to focus on um, Tbilisi resilience uh, strategy. So these are um, goals and actions it proposes. So for example, coordinate an emergency response plan. Uh, and uh, these are implementation of um, uh, status of each um, um plans, for example, establish an emergency response committee for Tbilisi, and it was in development phase um, at the time of adopting the resilience strategy, and it's still in development phase. It's the same with um, uh, disaster response and recovery plan. Uh, these two are still aspirational, which refers to community emergency preparation preparedness and risk awareness training program or preparedness program for kindergartens. Um, this multi-hazard risk assessment, it's, um, they said in development, but it's not finished yet. We haven't seen um, the document and so on. Um, so even though we have this strategy, it doesn't mean that uh, we are <laughs> that close to achieve its, its goals. Its goals. 
Um, then I will, I hope I have enough time to briefly go through the um, findings of my research. It was actually um, uh, covering cold Georgia and different climatic zones and different uh, groups of vul vulnerable groups. Uh, of women uh, to um, identify some kind of to assess vulnerabilities of um, women in Georgia to the climate crisis. So I tried to bring here some examples based on um, uh, the urban uh, focus. So it has been representative uh, for urban um, areas as well. Later, I can send you a link if anyone will be interested to see the whole um paper uh, so it seems that according to what women said uh, they experienced the most severe impact comes uh, for them from heat waves and it was uh, 60 0.8 percent which said it uh, impacts their health conditions uh, then it was mentioned uh, droughts um, and uh, which they linked droughts with the health deterioration problems re reduced work capacity and reduced food supply um, in general it was mentioned that access to services um, are problematic in um, urban areas as well, not only in rural and in Tbilisi as well. Uh, and they said all this, um, especially for um, public transport, uh, access to it deteriorates significantly and delays during bad weather. So the transport system is not adapted uh, to extreme weather events. Uh, then um, there were some problems also mentioned, uh, and I was also trying to identify what are the environmental uh, problems uh, associated with urban areas for women. And it was said um, the uh, most mainstream answer was about air pollution, increasing cars, intensive construction. They also, women also worry about chaotic development of the settlement, disordered uh, sewage system, uh, pollution. Uh, and according to them, this and other environmental problems uh, were sent there and their children's health and children's problems were also mentioned many times. And uh, sense of safety, uh, increase uh, stress, and, and uh, creating women's mobility problems. Mm, uh, uh, so I will also add some other findings. Um, so they women worry about um, green spaces, um, not only in Tbilisi, in other urban areas, that um, they don't have uh, much, many places left where they can bring their uh, children to play safely. Uh, and they say these green spaces are decreasing uh, and access to them is also being restricted uh, because some places people need to pay for some uh, parks to get inside. So they were really concerned about it. Um, and the women uh, said that uh, parks in urban places help them to be closer to nature, enjoy its aesthetics, socialize and cope with uh, the summer heat. And uh, since there are not many places uh, like that uh, in summer, um, the demand to go outside from uh, cities is increasing. However, um, uh, according to them, it's getting more and more luxurious option because it's getting more expensive. Um, um, so, and they are concerned that they don't have much places where they can bring their children close to natural environment. Uh, so, and I have quote here, um, when you want to take your ch child to the fresh air, it should not be worth the whole year saving. There must be some places in the city where you can uh, rest with the mm, child. Uh, and another problem was about non-adapted infrastructure for um, uh, women with disabilities. Um, so I have quote here that such problems in, exist in many places. The bus is adapted, uh, but not the infrastructure infrastructure to get to the bus stop. Uh, and uh, another problem uh, which um, people started to discuss about uh, in Georgia is access to healthy food um, because there is not uh, quality control by the state and uh, the prices is increasing. So there is not really reliable information which is uh, bio or organic products in, uh, 
in general. So there were so many other interesting findings, but um, I realized um, uh, climate crisis is more uh, like express and shows itself uh, more in urban rural areas uh, due to many systemic problems and also geomorphology of uh, Georgia. So I can share it later with you. Uh, and I will try to start finalizing what I just said and uh, make emphasis of barriers, problems and needs uh, to enhance systemic planning of adaptation in Georgia and specifically in Tbilisi. So uh, there is no legal requirement so far for developing uh, and implementing a city level climate adaptation plan. So currently, we Georgia is working on climate law. So I hope we will see this kind of uh, legal requirement uh, for that. Even though we have like Tbilisi's um, signatory of Convenant of Mayors and like it has some kind of obligation, but uh, they always try to postpone it and it's not uh, legally binding. Um, and in general, I see that we have lack of understanding of adaptation and understanding its importance, um, not only in Tbilisi, in whole Georgia, even even, even among the climate experts, uh, since we see like more emphasis comes um, on mitigation. Um, lack of data, evidence for the city level adaptation and absence of effective monitoring and evaluation systems. Even though we have monitoring um, and early warning systems at two, if I'm not mistaken, uh, areas of Tbilisi, but I saw some reportages uh, by journalists that they are not working and GPS systems are like not operating at all with that early warning system. So I don't know if we can call it that we have this kind of system or not. Uh, lack of resources, so can it be financial or human resources and expertise in this field um, within the um, city hall? Um, adaptation needs um, to be embedded across various strategies and action plans. Um, can it be like green city plans or mobility um, strategies? Uh, collaboration between institutions on adaptation and I see in um, the countries where adaptation where like countries work on adaptation more it's like huge collaboration of different institutions academia or decision makers on business or everyone so but in Georgia it's huge gap um, uh, focuses on mitigation is also perceived in, um, um, I heard in many discussions that it seems it's uh, perceived as a barrier for effective adaptation, that cities try to have more focus and ambitious plans for mitigation since it's more encouraged um, and then people say, oh, it's an undermining adaptation goals. And uh, I can say it's uh, relevant for Tbilisi as well. We have short term and ad hoc view on adaptation issues and risks. Um, unfortunately, when we see hazards is happening, then we have failures that uh, we are not prepared for that. And last but not least, um, to implement existing policies and adopt more holistic approach. Maria mentioned different solutions of adaptation. And I usually say, like for me, infrastructure building is just a mainstream and, um, approach. Uh, and we should uh, try to adopt uh, the visions uh, for uh, long term. Uh, so it could be changes in uh, land cover use and um, avoid transforming uh, land into urban land cover, which increases the risk of flooding of the city. This could be one solution. So uh, I would like to see more uh, long term visions in terms of adapting cities and political will, of course, uh, of that. The final words, uh, it will be, um, uh, it's uh, the quote again from the resilience strategy. It says like uh, need of a resilient and vibrant, vibrant city where residents are protected and safe, where there is access to opportunity and healthy natural environments and where we, I guess decision makers are empowered to plan ahead, ready respond to any challenge. 
And this is what we want to see. <laughs> and I guess every um, citizens um, of this country and of this city. Uh, but so far, we see we are really far from there. And there is a huge need of transformational change, and especially in planning uh, of this city. So um, I hope we will get there <laughs> one day. Uh, thank you so much. In case uh, you have questions, I will be happy uh, to address them, or you can also contact me anytime at these emails. Thank you, and over to Aneke. Yeah, thank you very much, both of you. It was extremely interesting, I think, uh, the theoretical introduction and uh, this example of Tbilisi. Uh, actually, I have a very spontaneous question to you, Mariam. Do you think that the uh, mud flow and the catastrophe that happened this summer, will this have any impact on the next elections in a way? Do you think that people will start to hold local governments responsible for what they have not been doing? Mm. Yeah, I wish I could have answer on that, but we see that political parties uh, started to be interested um, in this topic and uh, they ask experts to help them to understand what's going on and what could be the effective mechanism to cope with that. Um, but this landslide case, it has not been um, investigated properly uh, and um, even the government... Um, uh, institutions tried to propose some uh, um, ideas, but it's not based on science. And um, so they say that it was not possible to mobilize at the site earlier than two hours after the landslide. Uh, so this kind of things they try to manipulate. Uh, but uh, I hope this will be a good example, unfortunate, but good example to show what are the needs uh, and also to push uh, to the decision makers, whoever it will be after elections or before, to prioritize these problems. Because we see this year has been really uh, like... Um, year of um, hazards and disasters for Georgia and it has if not now I think what else can be yeah. Uh, yeah okay thank you very much I think there is a question in the chat but I can't read it um, because I don't uh, read Russian I don't know whether one of you maybe can ah okay Okay, I will be reading the question. So, Mariam will stay in the English channel, will be speaking English, and I will be speaking Russian for us uh, to have the language balance. So, uh, there are questions. There are two questions. One is about the democratic governance. Uh, what tricks the Belarus uh, govern? Uh, government can do uh, in its um, um, pretending of doing something to the city and the other question of what uh, measures of adaptation could be used in Belarus cities well the answer is the following look I'm always trying to focus on what could be done rather than on who is not doing what because there are so many things that are being missed and there are so many gaps that it's better to focus on at least something that could be done so taking your question look quite often based on my experience there is such a prejudice such a feeling such a prejudice in that there are some good um, good and kind uh, citizens and very bad uh, representatives of the authorities and speaking about Belarus uh, cities don't have the autonomy that they need in order to implement the measures for climate change adaptation and uh, look, Mariam shared Tbilisi, but if she was presenting Batumi, another Georgian city, and Georgia is a small country, in Batumi there would be different measures, different uh, adaptation plans. That is why when we are talking about climate change and adaptation measures, politically, uh, 
cities should receive autonomy to the uh, uh, to the extent that would be enough because they are knowledgeable of their situation of their population of the possible solutions and this is the very first step and unfortunately in such countries as belarus even before those political events we're not uh, talking about um, the current situation but even before that the uh, the regime which is uh, governing the country now is not favoring adaptation to climate change. Speaking about tricks uh, or possible measures, how to trick the government into helping the cities, well, I wouldn't say about the tricks, but almost everything that has been done in the uh, climate policy field has been implemented under the framework of international programs and these were programs that were supported by mayors and you know that uh, Maryam has presented has, she has shared that uh, Tbilisi is uh, another city which is a subject of mayor agreements and uh, these international programs were the main driving forces because uh, some cities they were um, under this mayor international agreements so there were um, these covenants of mayors so we have to say that uh, in Belarus there were quite many cities where the city administration was sincerely interested in taking part in such processes partially for receiving better financing which is not that bad and partially due to the fact that in some smaller town city administrations were trying to do something but now with the uh, political landscape uh, change all of those measures they uh, seized and uh, no any tricks are being implemented in order to pretend that cities are being adopted well i think this uh, mass planting of trees for a nice picture to show that uh, the employees uh, of this uh, uh, plant or factory they planted those trees and they make this picture well at them planting well maybe it is something but we know that no one is taking care of those trees afterwards and they are dying out well this is not ad adopting but uh, planting trees if you ask me is more about ecological literacy let's say someone is saying we have nothing for environment so let's plant the trees it seems to me like people are saying oh let's do something nice together without really knowing so uh, we have uh, a lot of uh, companies contacting us saying we want to have a team building activity we want to plant trees but if we say um, taking into account the urban planning we have to approach it in a smart way it's not just digging a hole a pit in the ground and putting there a tree it's not enough to check it out i was saying and Miriam was saying that the the um, cities should be greener but if we take a deeper look the urban area is the area that has to be adopted uh, for its citizens and very often people now say that uh, these uh, uh, thoughtless planting of trees has its own negative consequences now we have uh, we see very uh, popular um, trend of uh, urban meadows it is a very good idea, but it, uh, in its turn, um, provokes a high growth of population of insects, including mites. So we don't want to invite wild nature into the town. We want to invite nature, but not wild nature, because town is the place for people. So the planning should be very smart planning. So wherever you are going you will always see that there should be tight collaboration of all actors and the foundation should be scientific a strong scientific foundation Miriam was saying that in uh, those cities where the smart climate strategies are being developed at least several institutes universities are being invited and there should be good coordination so some of these measures they could push the agenda a little bit forward but it wouldn't do much because on the one hand when people are planting trees well maybe that's good because they are thinking about nature 
and having team building activity on building bushes is better maybe in a way than a team activity on strike ball or some other i don't know quest uh, activities but uh yeah they they are becoming more aware but it has to be better integrated i'm sorry i took more time and the second question Ah, okay, sorry. Yeah, the second question was uh, which uh, measures would be ideal? Yeah. Well, different adaptation measures. Very different. Very different adaptation measures. Everything has to start with risk assessment. In some area, you will see that an adaptation measure will include flood protection. In another city, you would see that it would be about a Campaign, informational campaign on water filtering for the agricultural community if it is a smaller area somewhere in um, uh, Belarus. So there is no one question, one uh, solution for all. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. We have a second question uh, from Vladimir. Uh, it's about uh, solar rooftop solar panels. Um, to adapt energy systems to heat waves. I don't know whether one of you is an expert on solar energy on the roof, but uh, in Berlin, this is very popular now and the city government is even uh, yeah, promoting it and supporting it financially. So I don't know what's your opinion on it. Well, I can like... I can try, mm -hmm. but to be honest, um, in terms of um, adapting energy system and um, especially solar panels to heat waves, um, I know um, that solar panels work during heat waves, but it will if it's too intense, uh, it, uh, solar panels might uh, face problems. Uh, but I don't have really expertise in that field. That it's, it's better to ask um, those people who understand this um, um, deeply. But what I can say in general, um, what we see, it's not about uh, these um, uh, tiny solar panels on one house. It's also there should be also vision how to adapt the whole energy system uh, to the climate change risks. Um, and uh, these kind of plans um, haven't even been discussed uh, in my country. And uh, and it's same for the transport system, for example. And this year we also faced that uh, trains stopped working because the, um, uh, the road was uh, flooded and uh, it um, uh, like... It, it was for three days, I guess, uh, the tr main uh, train, which goes from east to um, uh, west to Georgia, stopped working due to these uh, floods. So um, I wanted to say it's important to have a vision for whole system. But regarding to this um, installation itself, um, I'm not really sure. Uh, sorry, if uh, Maria, do you know anything about that? А, ну, опять же, я могу только, <laughs> могу только поддержать то, что сказала Мариам, потому что... Well, once again, I could support Mariam. I could say that uh, it is important to turn to experts. But what I could add, uh, if uh, we are saying that solar panels uh, are the measure um, to adopt, uh, we speak about electricity. Uh, a gener generation of electric power and do you mean that uh, it will um, supply electricity for air conditioning well there are many other ways uh, to adapt to heat waves and solar panels are a good way uh, as a substitute measure or additional source of power uh, but if we say that uh, we have to uh, use air conditioners as the only adaptation solution for the heat waves, this is not the best way. Uh, there are many other um, uh, measures that help to improve uh, heat and uh, insulation of the building, for example, planting more trees or using the shades, etc. Okay, thank you very much. We have another question concerning um, the um, participatory approach and other methods. I guess this is a question on the way that local or 
rules in general are made in order to include as many citizens and people as possible and to have yeah, their say in, in, in these regulations. So, Mayam, you already draw a bit on this because you said that in Georgia, obviously, there's a lack of this, in the lack of uh, cooperation between different institutions and the lack of really addressing people's needs. Um, do you know how whether there are better ways of of uh, yeah drafting legislation in other countries? Um, actually, we have the law and we have ratified our Hus Convention, which is about public participation uh, in environmental decisions. So, according to law, before adopting any kind of decision or issuing permit to certain. Um, um, projects, uh, they should be consulted with um, the wider public. So there are procedures um, also written, uh, what are the required procedures that the projects should go through um, before getting the environmental permits. Um, so we have this, but um, it, they we face many problems of implementing this, and sometimes they are just uh for legitimizing uh, their decisions uh, so uh, so just to say shortly we have this but uh, we have problems of uh, implementing this to have meaningful participation well maybe because we for se uh, several mm -hmm. times already touched upon this problem of implementation and of holding governments accountable for what they are doing or not doing maybe we could talk a little bit about uh, the role of journalists and media in this i mean actually it's the media who could inform people and really build up this public pressure maybe uh, so people really demand something from their governments mm -hmm. but uh, i don't know i know of course tanya but i don't know whether all the other participants whether they are really journalists or rather NGO people. So maybe we could uh, yeah, do, uh, discuss a little bit about how to really intensify this climate reporting and uh, this building up of a public pressure. Tanya, you have re you recently have written something about uh, urban development and, uh, and greening. So maybe what you can tell us a little bit about what you found out during your research. Well, me personally, no, I didn't publish anything recently and didn't write anything recently, but we had a series of articles where we explain how the uh, forest uh, was planted out and then uh, people were going out to check the development and the um, what has happened to this newly planted uh, forest and then people saw that uh, actually trees were dying out and we were writing and we were covering it as a fact. Could I add something here? Well, when Mariam was uh, speaking about the interaction and cooperation in the um, in the planning, urban planning, we don't have only two groups uh, of uh, citizens uh, and uh, uh, um, governments. We have also business and science as additional groups. Um, citizens are not experts. We always say that citizens are experts of uh, their life. Uh, they can just say, well, I like a park or it's too hot where I am. But they are not experts uh, and uh, governments should rely on scientific uh, knowledge. Uh, so citizens, they can't uh, pay for the services they want and the business has to be invited. So in order for the system to work and this cooperation to function, the role of uh, uh, media is very significant. They should write about it. And uh, uh, media very often, uh, they are look for some drama, for example, citizens want something and uh, the city administration doesn't give it to them. But the uh, taking into account uh, like more holistic approach, um, journalists could write about uh, some specific uh, topics or some specific project that is being proposed by the university to the uh, city administration. But it is very important. Maybe it is less dramatic than other subjects, but uh, I would ask uh, journalists uh, uh, 
because very often they come to experts and they say, oh, give us some subject uh, which would give us a very um, dramatic uh, title. Um, and we want them to write something important and to make it so interesting that people would read it. We're asking them how about to write a title that uh, would make people interact with the material that you are preparing. Okay, this is the end of my response. Uh, I don't know, Ira, whether we have another question in the chat, maybe in Russian, or is it uh, the one we already discussed before? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's about Green City Action Plan, right? No? Okay. Okay, are there any other questions from the side of our participants? Yes, of course. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. My name is Vladimir, and I'm from uh, Gomel, which is located in southeast Belarus. And I would like to say that, uh, well, first of all, uh, I'm the head of the youth uh, union and we were talking about universities, about academia, because presently we have very little experience uh, in working with the renewable energy sources. Vladimir asked a question. So what do we do in this regard? For example, our residents, of course, mostly are using some primitive uh, solar collectors to heat up the water at their summer houses or at home. This is one of the ways. But in terms of the planning at the urban level, we have very few suggestions and very few examples. For example, the, some large corporations such as Belarus Oil, Belarus Neft, they did install solar uh, panels uh, and some even uh, built small power plants using solar pow power. But the problem is that presently, well, this probably does not form part of the uh, state planning. Has our ministry or the Council of Ministers maybe contacted you to help them develop something? Well, you see, Vladimir, no one from Belarus has contacted me in years now. No one is contacting me. Well, and I probably also don't contact them too from my side. But yeah, in principle, we do have such programs. But again, if you'll talk to the energy experts, maybe they will give you a different response. But their programs were introduced in energy. And I also know that, for example, um, well, after строительство uh, in 2018-2019, they started organizing public hearings uh, of the master plans of the cities. And of course, you can criticize what they did, but at least I know that for sure, because I know these people, that they try to do that uh, as much as possible. They try to make it as efficient as possible. But how well is that work carried out at the moment? Well, I think that these programs all are not operational anymore and honestly speaking i don't know what is happening with the energy sector yeah, you know i just I just wanted to share this pain with you because you know today well we're not even invited by the mass media by the state on mass media so we can only use our own website our own social me media and our own social networks do that they stopped inviting us all in all so if we take the southeast of belarus uh, our palacea the crops uh, are decreasing, uh, there are droughts, there are floodings, uh, there is a lack of water. Can you imagine it? In the south of Belarus, we do not have enough water to get plenty of crops and a good yield. But so I don't know, we have to think because uh, we already have the new uh, climate zones in the south of Belarus. Uh, and we have to think about how we can participate in that. How can we contribute to that? Because I do not know. Yes, we used to work with Nikir and we did some calculations. So we do not have enough water to, for example, in Moser Rayon, we cannot get the sufficient number of water to grow 
crops and grow vegetables. So we have to somehow bring it, deliver it to increase the yield. So I thought that maybe you as the experts, as professionals who are dealing with climate change could somehow impact it. Let's think about how we can do that together, having united our efforts. Well, for example, the project uh, that uh, EU for Environment that was mentioned, no, it wasn't mentioned here. I'm sorry, it was mentioned EU for Climate. It was mentioned during a different event. They developed the national adaptation strategy and it was almost ready, but then uh, it stopped. Uh, but again, this is our very peculiar situation in Belarus. And here we probably have uh, uh, to also look at other countries such as Georgia, what can be done there because there, with all the challenges that I understand, they are, well, there is a better collaboration there. But in Belarus now we just have to talk about it. We have to look at every case individually. Honestly speaking, it's hard for me to even imagine what is happening with adaptation in Belarus at the moment, because it's been a few years since I uh, stopped working with the Belarus-related international programs. Okay, we'll try to impact and influence that, but maybe we could get at least some kind of methodological guidance from you, some recommendations. Uh, okay, let's discuss it separately then. Yes, yes, okay, okay, because we're discussing, even though we have a regional seminar, but we're talking about our own Belarus things. Yeah, oh, okay, thank you, thank you. It was a pleasure, it was a pleasure, likewise. Bye-bye. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I just had a short look on my mobile phone and the watch, and uh, so we uh, unfortunately we already are running out of time, and uh, so I think we have to discuss everything else bilaterally if we want to go on discussing some things. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you, Maria and Mariam, for your interesting inputs. But also thank you, Jana and um, Alina, for uh, your interpretation. It was a pleasure. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for uh, coming and attending. So see you very soon again, hopefully. Very soon we will have a new uh, topic in this series of webinars on climate change. Thank you very much and have a nice Wednesday.